Greetings, it is I, Tactus Nair van Jacobin, your Lord and Emperor here at the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. We are diving back into Star Trek adventures. It's time for us to uh, um, set a course for the Delta Quadrant. We're going to be following the path of the uh, Federation starship Voyager and meeting a couple of the species that they encounter along the way and learning to play them. Granted, they are originally Delta Quadrant species, but there are various ways that you can have a storyline based around them being somewhere. Similar to Voyager, they could be lost from home. They could have, you know, you could have said like one of them joined with Voyager that they didn't show it on screen or something like that. Or There's a lot of things that could have a reason for playing one of them and certainly having an adventurous in a far off area exists too. So these are indeed uh, more unique species because they are in a different region that there isn't as much connection to. Unlike with the Gamma Quadrant and the DS9 kind of species, there was a wormhole there, kind of into the big old center of the area around them. This was a lot of traveling. But we'll talk about them, <clears throat> and then I'm going to go over a little bit of information about other sources of species to talk about. I'm not going to dive into depths about them as much because they're kind of a mixed bag of some things to talk about. Um, some uh, some stuff you can find online, some stuff that Modifius has provided, stuff like that that's beyond just the basic books. But we'll talk about those a little bit. Anyway, we should get started as talking about this first of many species to discuss about. And let's talk about the Ankari. <clears throat> so they are reptilian, and they are, of course, native to the Delta Quadrant. They are warp capable, but... They use a different kind of faster-than-light drive rather than warp drive. They kind of phase into a parallel realm that's kind of similar to subspace, but isn't subspace. Um, it's a realm that's also home to some uh, nucleogenic life forms uh, with bodies filled with nucleogenic en energy. Um... Much like how traditional subspace warp-based civilizations, uh, most forms of Ankari technology interface with the nucleogenic realm. It's a very rare technology, and there's not a lot of species that can deal with it. Uh, so detecting, tracking their vessels is very hard. Um, and it's a big strategic advantage, but... One thing that is about the Ankari is they aren't a warlike people. Um, they have this actual unique relationship with the beings that they find in that neogenic world, uh, the interdimensional beings, that they consider them these heralds of good fortune. And, you know, it's a cultural thing almost there. So they are very technological and, sp and scientifically advanced. They have fast and light travel that they travel through another dimension. But the thing is, they have this almost spiritual aspect to their people and a very traditional aspect. And, you know, this connection with the respect of the inter interdimensional beings kind of deepens in that belief system. So, trade is a big thing about that, um, and they do like to celebrate the conclusion of successful endeavors, um, and basically summoning these interdimensional beings to bid their allies good fortune. So, looking at attributes for them, the bonuses are fitness, insight, presence. Their trait is, of course, Ankari. They are reptilians, um, so they have very reptilian biology, uh, thick, coarse skin, light to, light to dark brown coloring. Uh, they don't have hair, though they do have spines that run the back of their skulls. Uh, kind of brows that um, have the ability to detect vibrations and kind of give them a sixth sense. They're kind of brow ridges. Their harmonic language, that's their native language, developed due to that kind of sense. The talents they have are favored by fortune. Um, and, of course, vibration sense. So one based upon their belief in luck and one based upon their ability to sense. And so that is the Ankar. 
All right, let's continue to move on because there are some more species, plenty more species to talk about today. Uh, and these are a lot of images I had to look up online because uh, it's the easiest way to get these too. Mm, sorry, I'm going to mute myself for a second as I blow my news. All right. Let's talk about the Jai, J-Y-E. So they are in a number of sectors. Uh, they've got very highly administrative and organizational abilities, which they do offer to other cultures for a price. So they are found throughout a lot of the quadrant, uh, usually employed under host species. Um, that are struggling with some kind of ability that's normally beyond their uh, some kind of some kind of problems beyond their ability or even desire to possibly address. So they get these basically like administrative people to take care of the problem for them. Um, they actually believe that this is the greatest export their species has. The Jai does. Um, and they take strides to ensure that any circumstance that has been uh, uh, that uh, blah, 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 uh, sorry brain fart um, they basically try to make sure that the no matter what there's a satisfactory outcome for whoever's employing them that you know that whatever they do there's at least some kind of satisfaction they believe it's their duty to uphold contracts that they've been assigned to, and they work tirelessly to ensure that any business agreements are properly governed, and um, all to make sure that there's satisfaction uh, of the employing government or culture. Um, and for the most part, they are an unremarkable humanoid species, pale skin, supporting lavender spots, not a lot of facial hair, uh, little to no, um, and they are indeed administrators and organizers more than anything so they don't do a lot of manual labor or exercise so control presence and reason are their attributes um yeah so a lot of them are trained in areas of expertise professionally and they are still capable of physical feats similar to those of humans but they're not really known for their physical abilities so like Physically, they'd be comparable to a human normally. It's just a lot of them don't dive into training that a human might do. Like, they almost, like, a lot of them just fit that, you know, average baseline human physicality. Um, they do originate from a colder, a frigid M-class planet on the edge of a... Ha on their star's habitable zone. Um, it's a... They don't have a lot of solar light. It's kind of cold, relentless winters. So they do resist cold. Um, but they also have a lot more problems than a lot of other humanoids when it comes to temperatures. So their two talents are, of course, based around their administration organizing abilities with maximized efficiency and natural coordinator. So that is our good friends here, the Jai. Now let's talk a little bit about another major group from this entire thing. That's not a great image, but that is a Borg. That's Hugh there. I could have taken like seven of nine because that would be more appropriate, but I thought just, you know, let's go for this one. So the liberated Borg. And, you know, here's where the thing about liberated Borg comes from is the fact that it is like, you're usually another species that's become the Borg. So there's lots and lots of species that have become part of the Borg over the centuries. If you're unfamiliar with the Borg, I mean, this is a Star Trek thing. You really should know about them. But they are a cybernetic species, as best to call it. Basically, a hive mind that assimilates other organic beings and makes them into cyborgs that makes them into drones that are members of their hive mind and expanding their forces that way. They assimilate planets, cultures, worlds. They look for new technologies. Um, but from various things that have happened, twists of fate, stuff like that, there are times when drones leave the collective. And that is where the stats for a liberated board comes in. Um, you know, you're removed from the hive mind. You know, 
you can maybe get your identity back during that time. There are sometimes issues, sometimes more with that kind of thing happening. It's not like being removed from the hind mind automatically makes you return to who you are or remember who you are. Because the fact is, you still have a massive amount of data in your head. You're a cyborg, you have computer implants that are in your brain and stuff too. And also, you know, making, understanding your individualism of yourself out of an entire, like, amount of information there is kind of hard too. So, you know, you get the opportunity maybe to get a life back. You're a liberated Borg. And it can happen. And that can come from a lot of different species, of course, because you never know when you were taken or how you ended. The Borg have very good travel ways to travel across the uh, area. Oh, mm. So, that's the thing is, yes, and also noting, like, you know, the Borg have been around for a very, very long time, you know, it, it they, they're, they're very next to centric, but they could be other ages. So, all liberated Borg follow the mixed species rule, um, basically they're being mixed with liberated Borg with whatever species they were assimilated from. Uh, they receive the traits from both species, uh, thus they may use the attributes from either Liberated Borg or the original species, may select talents from their original species or the Liberated Borg talents. Uh, so they follow that mixed species rules that exist for, you know, uh, cross crossbreeds uh, between different species. Crossbreeds, is that the proper way of saying it? Between species? I don't know. Uh, cross species children of, of mixed parentage, of different species, uh, alien species. Uh, basically, they follow those rules, except one is robot, the other is not. So the Borg, uh, Liberated Borg, attributes are control, fitness, and reason. Their trait, of course, is Liberated Borg. Um, the cybernetic implants they have remaining in common are the big things, because plenty of uh, implants can be removed. There are others that safely can't, because they're so integrated into their bodies. And that's one of the issues with when you're out of the collective and you can remove some of the cybernetics. You can get some of the stuff you originally have back. Some you can't because it depends on how much you've been changed or how much has been put into you and also how much kind of technology you have access to. So being bored, you're resist resilient to natural diseases and ailments. Um, electric shock and exotic radiation affect them a lot because of their cybernetic systems. Um, if you have still have a lot of implants, you can do things like survive hard vacuum or various hard, harsh environments could protect you from that even for a little while. But again, you might also be susceptible to influence from the collective. And, uh, you know, if some of your implants fail, it could be bad for your health. So also, they traditionally don't have to sleep conventionally. Uh, and so they need some kind of uh, Borg regeneration outcome. So the two talents you choose from are Borg implants or a uh, directive neural interface. Um, and, uh, you know, um, you could be very seven of nine and have your name something like that, but you could also just have your original name too. Uh, both are options. And the Delta Quadrant book does supply a number of information on some board implants that you might have or possibly have. So that's our good friend, the Borg and the Liberated Boards. Uh, what was this? Did I miss one? Oh, that's the giant. Ooh, did I miss one here? How did I miss one? No, that was the giant. Right? No? No, that was the giant. I, I'm confused by my names here. Uh. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's the name of the... It's the name of the person here that's on the image, and I'm like, what? <laughs> Don't mind me, scuff. Uh, all right. Let's talk about the locker room. Oh, boy. <clears throat> so, uh, the locker room have incredible technical abilities, specifically with holograms, and there are very few other species that could possibly max, uh, maximize them. 
Um, for centuries, they've used very uh, incredible detailed, uh, very um, well-made holographic programs to perform various tasks. Um, kind of creating a task-specific servitor, servitor race almost out of it. Um, so it's part of like their holograms became more sophisticated, got better mental capability. Um, conflict erupting was something that was inevitable. Um, so, and it did. And there was century, decades of basically civil war with their holograms. The, a photonic insurgency uh, that was devastating for the uh, locker. Um, they had been totally dependent on the holograms they had created for a lot of tasks, including hazardous and menial ones, not necessary to their modern lives. Um, and the locker uh, photonics, the holograms weren't really just satisfied with escaping these circumstances. They struck at their society, um, civil disobedience, terror acts, basically force, trying to force liberation of their beings. Um, so Lockram now have become more resentful of photonic life form, watching their society brink at the teeter of destructions, love and loss to attacks carried out. <sighs> so Lockram many willingly then joined their naval forces to track down and destroy holograms that not only originated Lockerham, but and independent holograms as they see them. They feel them as dangerous to organic life. So they developed a holographic technology so powerful it rebelled against them, and yes. So, their attributes are daring, insight, and reason. They're very similar to humans, uh, the Lockerham, except the V-shape uh, ridge that uh, runs the, the brow of their nose to the hairline. Uh, their world's a temperate one with mild seasons and fair weather. It doesn't have a lot of natural resources, so they had to mine deep into their planets, crunched, and eventually out to their solar system for a lot of materials. Um, again, holograms for a lot of this menial labor. Um, even with that, though, they retain the physical stature and dorms that they had as a base race. Um, and again, because of what's happened with the rebellion, a distrust that they have for holograms nowadays. So their two talents are hologram taskmaster and photonic prosecutor. Um, so they certainly have a dislike of holograms nowadays. Let's talk about the Mari. So, the Mari are telepathic speakers. Uh, a species that are very new to traveling out into the stars. They are still known for their pacifism um, because they were plagued by a lot of violent crime until a few short decades ago. Uh, so a lot of issues with crime and stuff that were occurring with them have caused them to kind of have this idealism of pacifism. They outlawed violence uh, through um, basically introducing a new technique allowed them to extract aggressive thoughts from their minds it did reduce crime a lot and so they have a mostly crime free society it's just the fact that also this technique doesn't isn't always successful and when it fails instead of trying something else they employ a much more invasive medical procedure that restructures the neural pathways of the brain um it can be definitely considered and seen upon as a kind of thought policing um, that violates basic sentient rights. But they, as a species, believe it necessary to ensure the peaceful existence of their species. So they welcome visitors, but they enforce their justice system on outsiders, just as much as they do on natives. So, they do because they do worry that visitations can impact the local populace. So, someone that's an aggressive species, a good example being a Klingon, again, probably not going to meet them necessarily, Delta Quadrant versus, you know, uh, a Beta Quadrant species, but if they come, to come into contact with them, they're certainly in conflict, and their response would be provoked. Um, so, it does on the surface look very utopian there. There is this definite dark undercurrent there. Um, and, again, another thing is, with the removal of very aggressive and violent thoughts, there have actually become a black, a black market that is developed to provide sensory rec recreation 
of such thought patterns. Um, so there's plenty of that basically see aggressive thoughts as a drug and will pay exorbitantly to basically get a fix of these forbidden emotions and thoughts. And um, another thing though is because they don't really have a control or a connection to these kind of emotions, there's a lot of them that can then succumb to those and become violent because of it when they experience. And due to their sensitive empathic abilities, um, those thoughts can spread, almost like a violent virus to other parts of the population. Um, so that's why a lot of times Mari try to prevent the exposure to violent thoughts and, and things like that in the first place. So control, insight, and presence are their attributes. Um, and, you know, as a Mari trait, yeah, they uphold mental pacifism through memory purging. Granted, there is some similarities to Vulcan's mental conditioning. Um, physically, they're very much similar to human, uh, with a lot of physical, uh, similar physical characteristics. Um, their technology level is about a century or more behind the Federation, though their medical techniques, especially with those affecting thought patterns, are very significant advanced so they they have a portion of their technology that is advanced a lot more than what uh, the Federation would have their homeworld's tempest and uh, kind of warm nature it could be easily considered a vacation spot for the quadrant very rise at any if not for their justice system so so Maori do end up off-world though it is rare but it happens uh, usually on a passage or on another species ship as for talents, uh, empath is a talent, of course, uh, and passive uh, pers uh, pers pers persuader. God, that persuader as a word was trying to escape my brain. Ah. Let's talk the Monaeans. So, they are a nomadic people. They lost their homeworld a long time ago, many generations ago. Um, but centuries ago, however, they discovered a very unique planetary body, an artificial world of water. Um, so they built an entire civilization in the shallow region of the planet's surface, uh, kind of underwater realm. Um, many still live aboard their starships and kind of venture from the depths of their new home um, the water is their adopt the name of their adopted world sometimes they explore it but the depths of the ocean because it is a water-based artificial planetoid there's a lot more pressure and it's very difficult to explore those depths so they don't really understand their planetoid homes function very well um their government reflects their aquatic origin, named the Maritime Supremacy. Uh, they do have a powerful fleet of starships despite this, but they don't venture, venture more than a few hundred light years away. Uh, their old navigational charts have long since become outdated, and wherever they originated from before they came here has kind of become myth. So control, fitness, and reason are their attributes. Um, most likely they evolved from some amphibia, uh, amphibian mammalian or other aquatic species, um, basically because of their physical experience. Uh, their skin coloration and marsh markings do reflect an aquatic origin. They're all capable swimmers, can hold their breath for an extended period of times. Um, they still are air breathing and require an atmosphere similar to humans. So they would be more evolved from something akin to an aquatic reptile or a whale, something that is still an air breather, but would be aquatic. Uh, their talents are a nomadic heritage because, again, they did exist for uh, many generations without a homeworld before they found this water prize. And, of course, a mariner because now that they've lived for centuries on the water planet, they're more adapted to that again. So an interesting species there. Now, of course, uh, I could have gone for good old Kess from Voyager, but nope, we're not going to give Kess for talking about the Okampa. <laughs> of course I wouldn't. So the Okampa are a 
big oddity when it comes to a lot of humanoid species because they are very, very short-lived in comparison to many species. They rarely live more than a decade. That's pretty short for a species. And for most of their history, they've been under the watch of the caretaker, the member of an extremely powerful etrogalactic civilization. Uh, it basically, at some point, the caretaker was responsible for making their home world nearly uninhabitable and then spent centuries ensuring the people could have everything they need. And this relationship even continues after the caretaker dies and basically as a final act, provide them with enough energy reserves to hold out for another half decade at best. Is that enough for them to survive? Hard to say. They're physically very close to that of humans. Their physiology, though, is very different inside. So physically, when you look at them, they look very similar to human, but inside, very different. Um, again, they only live to be about 10 standard years old. Um, it can be extend, expended through advanced medical techniques. Um, they have similar stages to insects in their growth. They develop, uh, proceeds through three stages. Uh, basically, periods of stability and then rapid aging. Uh, when they're born, they remain in a childlike state for a brief year before rapidly aging and growing to pseudo-adulthood. Uh, they remain in this stage for another four years before reaching sexual maturity, uh, a stage which lasts only a few months before fading. Uh, and then they continue to age through their adulthood before undergoing a final rapid development stage that marks their twilight. Um, once their final stage is kind of hit, they only expect to live no more than a year or two before expiring. Um, also, very interestingly enough, they do possess powerful latent telepathic abilities that had become dormant to their species. But if they're allowed or nurtured into development, these abilities range from simple empathy and telepathy to more powerful advanced forms of precognition or even telekinesis. Um, the full range of their um, latent telepathic abilities is unknown. So control, insight, and presence are their attributes, and their traits are Okamba, of course. Um, so we've talked about their development much more, a little bit more insect-like than uh, most other humanoids uh, that look actually similar to human because they do not look insect-like um, because of the caretaker's support for all this time their society is stunted they've been entirely dependent on the caretaker for what's been provided to them when they're separated from the welfare state they become curious, studious learners devouring information with incredible speed. And of course, learning psychic feats even are a big part of it. So their talents are quick learner and telepath. Anyway, thing is because they're short lifespans for the telepath side of things, it means that you don't have to be a young character to develop your abilities. They could develop their abilities later in life. Um, so, uh, there are plenty of things like telepath that's usually cho chosen during character creation. This is one of the examples of, if you were playing in Okampa, you could take ca telepath after character creation when you get an additional talent. Because, you know, just because of the nature of their species and their short lives, you could just learn it later on in life. It could just happen. So that's the Okampa. No cast for you. I did not have a great picture of these because most of them were The Rock. Thanks, The Rock. As a guest starred playing one of this species, <laughs> the Pandari. Uh, the Pandari champion, if you want to look it up, was it was The Rock. Um, thanks, Dwayne. Uh, anyway, here's another one of the Pandari, a female. <sighs> so, uh, uh, you know, when... A crowd roars for the next uh, Sunkatsu match. They're normally ro roaring for a Pandari. Um, they've remained champions of the interplanetary com uh, competition because of their physical size and tenacity. 
Um, they see this as a political and propaganda victory and it propels their home world into a position of prominence. Pandari fighters are known for their immense physical stature and ill-tempered demeanor, and it makes them very good as being combative. Um, politically, the Pandari are a minor power in their region of space. They do maintain excellent relations with many of their neighboring system. Uh, this cultural alliance ensures that they have uh, known an extended period of peace, and their feared warriors test themselves in the arena instead of the battlefield. Uh, the masculine Pandari are often uh, the vision others think of when picturing the species. Um, though other genders are effective in combat, too. Um, maybe uh, those that are smaller in statures tend to be more agile and finesse over raw physical power. So they do have both kind of builds there. Their attributes are daring, fitness, and presence. And... Pandari, on the outward appearance, seem near human, with hair and skin tone similar to humans or other similar humanoids. Uh, they do possess very strong bone and, bone and cartilage growths along the bridge of their noses and their brows and their hairline. The likeness ends at that point in time. Physiologically, they're a lot more robust, uh, have redundant palmatory and neurological systems in their body that allow them to maintain tremendous amount of physical punishment. Um, and they have a nearly genetic predisposition to aggressive behavior that makes them great warriors. The talents are born to fight and robust physiology. That's the Pandari for you. All right, let us talk about uh, the Scarians. Scari so, the Scarians are one of the most one of the oldest and most technologically advanced species in all of the Delta Quadrant. They've enjoyed hundreds of years of peace and prosperity. They're warm and welcoming, and they are round, renowned throughout the region for their hospital, uh, hospitable civilization. They enjoy guests and visitors to their world. They have, Despite these advancements they have, they don't claim a large domain, and instead are found in a handful of colonies outside of their homeworld. They maintain a small, very powerful fleet and primarily rely on advanced transporter technology called a, a trajector to travel between destinations. Similar to the Federation, they have a strict rule in when it comes to sharing technology and basically non-interference with other cultures. This has caused some frictions between them and their neighbors. Technologies like their spatial trajector uh, relies exclusively on unique characteristics to their homeworld. And it really doesn't function anywhere else. Despite this, they are generous people and will provide aid to those in need so long as the aid remains within some provisions of their basic law, the Skarn canon. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, more Klingon-like for the last one. There. So basically, as long as they fit within this law that they have, almost like a prime directive for them, they can still provide aid. They are avid storytellers, relish hearing stories, anecdotes, myths from other cultures. Um, they do enjoy and desire cultural expression, especially literature, almost to the points of hedonism. Um, though they still are very polite and will only retell and repeat such things with the permission of the culture or individual that originated. So if you tell them a story, they will keep that story and they will not share it Unless you gave them permission to share it. It's like, allow you to tell the story. Their attributes are control, reason, and presence. So they are, again, a species that is very similar to humans or other near-human species. Uh, they have similar height and mass to humans. Similar range of skin colors and hair colors. Uh, their utopian existence has eliminated a lot of forms of hard labor. And so they mostly, by and part, enjoy a life of leisure. Um, they have slight fames and slight styles of dress. They prefer loose, flowing robes and delicate wire uh, frame headwear. Uh, their talents are canonic law and riveting storytelling. Let's talk. Uh, we're not going to, again, not going to show Neelix, uh, Neelix, or whatever his name is. I'm butchering it today. Neelix, 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 Neelix. Atalaxian. 
So, Talaxians. So the thing about them is they are resilient and reliant and reliable. They're one of the species that's most widely rec recognized and dispersed throughout the Delta Quadrants. They've been warp capable for millennia and have encountered countless species and traveled to nearly every quadrant, uh, corner of the quadrant during that time. They're sociable, good-natured travelers by the, for the most part and enjoy the companies of others. Um, unlike a lot of species that have been warp capable for a long time, they're not really known for their technological capabilities. It wildly, it's wildly varies from group to group. Um, they don't really have a huge military presence, a significant large empire. It mostly is due to the war between them and the Hagodan Order that left both sides basically exhausted. Um, and the war ended when the Talaxian government surrendered, basically following a detonation of weapon of mass destruction on their moon. Um, Basically, this trauma of the war resulted in a large number of them seeking safety beyond their space. And a lot of them, at this point in time, again, because of the trauma, avoid confrontation, flee rather than fight most of the time. They aren't really cowardly by nature, though it's like when they are left with no other opportunity but the fight, they will display levels of courage and heroism that can be seen in very few other species. It's sort of like, if they don't need to fight, they won't. They will do everything they can to avoid a fight. But when you get into a fight with them, it will be to the bitter end, and it will be in the most heroic fight you could have. So, this avoidance of physical confrontation, though, does not spill over to their social dealings. Um, they rarely are fearful of speaking their mind when offended or upset is basically what it is. So when it comes to big scale conflict, yeah. But when you're in a face to face with one of them, they will speak their mind and often be, you know, let you know when you've upset them. But they do enjoy good food, good company, and many of them consider them as culinary experts. Um, though that also depends on who you're talking to and what their friends may say. So they're an interesting species that certainly has a lot of opportunity. I've, as a lot of these species, these have really have the most of being probably in another game. Uh, certainly because of their well-traveled nature, you could be a Talaxian in anything. Uh, they are found in large areas throughout the uh, Delta Quadrant. Again, having explored most of it, technically. So, so uh, they are very humanoid at first glass, of course. They do have several interesting biological adaptations. Uh, first and foremost, they're capable of enduring heat well beyond that of a, uh, what an average human could tolerate and can go very long without food, uh, without water, I'm sorry. Uh, their skulls have a very pronounced ridges with plates where the kind of plates meet. Uh, their hair is thin and wispy and large portions of their heads are bald uh, for better cooling. Um, their sight's a little bit less refined than humans but their senses of taste and spell are very keen in comparison. So their talents then are um, actually three they have options for, a being of many talents, infectious nature, and widely traveled. Faxing are a fun one there. Uh, one I would definitely recommend it would be very good for you. Let's talk about the uh, two right here. So, Long ago, a, another species, the Vaduar, were the undisputed masters of their region of space. Uh, but like a lot of empires, uh, eventually those they dominated rose up and overthrew them. The foremost member of this alliance that devastated the Vaduar was the Tore here. Um, they basically took the opportunity to fill the space the Vaduar left. Um, they wouldn't become as powerful or as feared as the Vaduar, they do lay claim to a vast network of subspace corridors that give their ancestral enemies their strategic aid under space. Basically, they had, the Vaudoir had created these subspace corridors, used them to attack their enemies. The Torre have kind of taken it over, at least portions of it. So for nearly a thousand years, they have controlled this important territory, um, using it very similar to the Vaudoir, but less conquest for it, you know. They are an insular culture that protect the underspace and their livelihood with aggressive determination. Their control of it has allowed them to prosper and 
military supremacy on all worlds that connect to it, uh, and the jealousy that it guards. If you stumble into underspace through anomalies or by magicational inspect, you can expect interception almost immediately and all records of underspace purged from your computer. Uh, so attributes are control, daring, and reason. So, as a turret, as your trait, you're, you are an ancient spacefaring race. Uh, you were originally a thrall under the Vaduar. Now you control the underspace, the extra-dimensional realm. And um, with the control of that, you're powerful and feared. They're a resilient species, both mentally and physically. Their skin is ex extremely thick, and much of the body is covered with these cartilage-like protrusions. They don't have a proper nose, and it says, ex instead possess the ability to smell through air glands along their tongue, very similar to a snake. Uh, their traits are deep uh, determination, uh, underdweller, and that's it. So that's the foray for you. Ah. Um, um, bu, 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 bu. Anyway. There is one more species to talk about, of course. Um, that's all. So. Um, the Zal. They're known for their friendly, welcoming natures. They know... Amongst them, there's very little hardship. They, these technology has transformed their world into basically a paradise. They're technologically advanced, they're non-combative, and have no interest in ex aggressive expansion. But they do defend their territory if threatened from an outside source. Um, the once the Zal and the Krenum were engaged in a series of conflict that left both sides military exhausted. In recent dis decades, however, these conflicts have become nothing more than simple border disputes that rarely erupted to open hostilities. With their technological com uh, capabilities, um, want amongst their people has been effectively eliminated, very similar to Earth as it is in the Star Trek universe. They don't really have a desire for personal gain. They're welcoming to any uh, peaceful species and provide aid and support as long as it does not embroil in them in someone else's war. Their good nature can fade, though, when threatened, either personally or, or culturally. Um... They so all prefer to threaten retaliation before engaging on it with armed aggression, though, hoping that the opponent will kind of withdraw before things can become violent. So it's sort of like, you know, hey, hey, don't make me. Don't make me. So control, insight, and presence are their attributes. And the trait Zal, it means you are advanced, enjoying the benefits of technological capability. Having limiting want throughout your territory, you know, for a kind, welcoming, and generous nature. Um, their world is climate regulated, um, but they are no strangers to environmental extremes and capable of thriving in both extreme cold and heat. Uh, their bodies are covered in dermal ridges that regulate body temperature in a manner far superior to many other species. So very good thermal regulation. And that is one of their talents, thermal regulation. Of course, the other talent being warm welcome. That's the Zal. Now, that's it for our basic rundown of the different species, of course, that are in the Delta Quadrant. And I hope that's kind of given you over now. We have the four quadrants spoken about uh, in all the books that they were. Um, so, we, I do want to go over a few more things we can talk about. Because there are some more species you can play, but they're in a wide variety of places and you can look them up yourself. Uh, Modifiates itself has provided a few, as I talked about on a previous Discussing Tabletop episode after, uh, that came before this episode uh, was originally streamed. Um, one of the things they provided was things like some, a number of species associated with the new Lower Decks uh, book that came out. And uh, some of that could have been in it, some of that were not in it. Other places are that there is a PDF that I had uh, acquired many years ago. Uh, during my time uh, preparing for the May the 4th be Star Trek, uh, Star Trek Adventures More Races, uh, or More Species, I should say. Uh, that one provides the uh, a number in it. Uh, Anar, Android, Aquin, Augment, Benzipolian, Binar, Cassian, Cardassian. Some of these have been done since then, Changeling, 
Deltian, and Dossian, and Frosian, Eloran, Frangi, Friedborg, Gorn, Hologram, Horda, uh, Kelpian, Klingon, Noskin, Orion, Hacklid, Romulan, Sorian, Score. So that, that one there you can find with a lot of its stats. Again, some of these have been replaced since then, and some of these are in other books, which I would recommend checking out the two differences between them if you want to look up the more races book. But it is a very third-party thing uh, that exists. So I would, if you're interested in it, I would recommend that one for some extended things, but I would also talk about with your Game Master before allowing anything. Your Game Master will have a final decision whether any of those will be appropriate to your game, but it is options that are out there for you to look at. And as I said, um, things like uh, Modifius now more recently, um, I can point out which ones they had there. Give me a second, I forgot to... So I'll take a drink. Okay. In their community blog, more recently, they introduced uh, an even more lives, even new civilizations, which... Uh, Introduced the uh, Agar, Gaussians, Satians, uh, Clicklet, uh, Exocomp, their version of Gorm, a Tamarian, um, Kelion, and a Paclid there. And again, uh, those are just more options. Uh, eight playable species for you and your groups, and they are provided. Um, and the Lower Decks Campaign Guide uh, will have 11 playable species. So perhaps if I ever get that book, I'll talk about that in the future too. And maybe a couple other books though. But so see, there's a lot more options for species out there. And I'm sure other people have made third-party material for species that are out there that maybe you'd be interested in. Maybe will be really cool. And talk with your Game Master about them. Show them off, uh, discuss those. That's the thing is like, it's very similar to third-party material anyway. There's a lot of these, and Star Trek has so many alien species out there, which, you know, you'd look up Memory Alpha, Memory Beta to get information on them. Memory Alpha being the canon stuff, Memory Beta being the less canon stuff, but still depends on what your GM's using to get these descriptions of these things, and finding all of them as options to play probably doesn't exist, but certainly there are some out there that you can find, and you can find some interesting alien species out there that, you know, would be cool to play in your Star Trek games. And I think that's one of the things that we should reflect upon is, this is the big way you can come up with really interesting ideas and look at things in a lot of different mannerisms and stuff. Certainly there is a very through line for Star Fleet, but the original cultures that they came from, a lot of these people when coming into Starfleet and Federation, whether or not they're Federation species or not, and they're just joining Starfleet for some reason, shows off a lot of interesting ways that they can be played and cultures they could come from. And honestly, the entire biology and physiology of your being also makes a difference that makes it very interesting and just fun to play. So I definitely would recommend always keep an eye out, open mind about what's out there for when it comes to in, um, species to play in Star Trek adventures. The whole list here that I've gone through are some really great options, but there's more out there you can find, and whatever you want to play, make it fun, make it interesting, make it Star Trek. Anyway, I think that'll be good enough for today. I hope you enjoyed this uh, foray, once again, the species of Star Trek. Uh, there will probably be more Star Trek material in the future when I can think of some things. Uh, remember, I do live stream this on Twitch. Every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturdays, Tuesday, Thursdays in the afternoon, Saturdays is usually uh, late morning. And uh, this goes up on YouTube. So if you're watching me on Twitch, hi, thank you for joining Twitch. Uh, if you're watching me on YouTube, hey YouTube, thanks for checking this out a little while afterwards. You should jump, come by live and say hi. Um, remember, uh, subscribe, like, comment on YouTube side. Give a follow on Twitch. Those are the easiest things to do, all for free. And great ways to totally, you know, support the channels and to, you know, help me out a little bit. The easiest ways. Uh, like, comment, share, you know, that kind of stuff on YouTube. Even give uh, showing up and giving some support. Even lurking around for the uh, Twitch side. And uh, there are other ways to give support if you really want to. Things like subscribing on Twitch. Uh, Patreon I do have. I do have to update it. 
Uh, if you're looking for information about my schedule or what's going on with me, anything like that, I do have a Discord and a twi uh, Twitch. Uh, links down below. I usually just are filled with my brain farts and scheduling and most of that, and I, I'll put more out social media stuff in the future too. Anyway, um, thank you. I hope all of you have a great rest of your day. I hope you enjoyed. I hope that uh, we can all, you know, play some more Star Trek adventures in the future. But until the next time, um, live long and prosper. And farewell. And I'll, I'll do it now. There we go. Live long and prosper. And farewell.